to the cloud. Okay, so <clears throat> our session is online learning what works, but we've we've called these sessions Future Teacher Reactivated, and, and Alistair is going to introduce you to um, the benefits of that. Indeed. So I think if you have taken part in previous sessions, which we'll find out about in a minute, then you'll know that uh, we've got a lot of content um, in an existing Xerti resource that Ron's in fact displaying on his screen at the moment. We've got recordings for the previous sessions as well. But those previous sessions tried to cover a huge area and uh, because they wanted to give you a breadth, a sort of a world map of what this area, this topic might cover. And within that world map, we then negotiated to the main continents and, and showed you the key things. And we had some activities and we had some discussion and they were very active and lively sessions, but they, we always left feeling, I wish we'd had more time just to engage with our audience and get people asking questions more. And that's what this is about because we've got the content already. So now, because we already have the content, these are more flipped. We did give you an option, an opportunity and some of the, um, advertising we put out beforehand for taking part in um, you know, putting your uh, activities, doing an activity beforehand. Uh, we'll have a look at one of those in a moment as well. It's more focused on the activity, so we're not going to go through all the research and all the background and, and so on. And it's more rooted in real experience of practitioners. And we've got three people who are going to give you a really good experience today of their practice. And so that's the reactivated. So let's have a look at the poll. Now, oh yeah, and there are more journeys as well, because as well as the webinar that we've done, um, we've disaggregated the webinar and we've got a self-access journey that you can use with your own teaching staff. Um, and all the information on how to access that is available on the right-hand side of the screen as you see it at the minute. And you'll have access to this resource in a minute. So here is the poll. Ron, do you want to talk people through the poll? Um, yeah, so there's, it's a multiple answer. This first question is multiple answer. So um, yes and no to the, the three separate questions, really. Um, we want to get an idea of uh, who's new and who's visited before and who's made use of the resources in advance of the session. So I'm monitoring the responses. So far, there's 18 of 34 responses. What's very interesting is the number of people that hadn't uh, been to the previous one, because you actually have a wealth of resources uh, waiting for you. Shall I give the link? Shall I pop the link in there now, Ron? For the um, you can do. Uh, yeah. So we've got a nice short URL um, in the text chat here. So that, if you weren't at the original webinar, that short URL will take you to the uh, Xerti resource. Xerti is the tool that we use. Ron will say a little bit about that right at the end. Um, but that resource with all the links to um, you know, research and models, etc., is available for you to use however you want with your own staff. Okay, so um, as you say, Alistair, it's interesting that quite a high number of people didn't attend the first session. Um, you can see the results on the screen there. And actually, if I move that across to um, my screen share, hopefully that's um, going to be part of the recording. So we see those results. Um, I'll stop that sharing and I'll change the question very quickly. And just launch that so separate question just with a single answer to get an idea of um, how many of the sessions for those that have attended the sessions before how many you've attended Of course, Alistair, Lillian and myself could all respond saying that we have attended all 19, all 19. and haven't missed a single <laughs> session. And of course, the great thing is if you have only attended one or two or none at all and you enjoy this one, 
every month for the next however many months it's going to take us we're going to be revisiting each of those sessions um, and adding value to them as well so hopefully this is a very different kind of online webinar to most that you go to because it's one that builds on existing material and builds into the future okay um thanks everyone for that so hopefully i'm still sharing my screen um we always in the registration form ask people what do they most want to learn from the particular session and topic that we're covering um, and you'll be able to um, navigate and read these um, responses in, in your own time. Uh, we don't want to go to that, we want to, you want to re revisit the pre-event activity Alistair, don't you? Oh, we want to know what people said during registration, yep. <clears throat> Okay, uh, no, so no. Okay. I think I think just before we started this webinar, I think if you scroll down, uh, Ron, there was just an interesting comment that we thought summed up uh, uh, all the kind of things that people want to find out at this um, uh, this webinar. We will be covering more or less, or we will have covered in our previous webinar. But um, I, I really like the one that says, uh, fourth from the bottom, it says, keep asking myself about what works and who decides. We thought that was really powerful um, kind of a, a motto or a meme that you can kind of use to kind of challenge uh, the way you're developing online learning. Um, so yeah, we're, we're just going to revisit a couple of the slides from our um, slide deck uh, from our last webinar um, before we move forward. Okay, so Ron, if you could go to, um, I think perhaps even go on to the next one, yeah. One of the fundamentals when you ask the question, online learning, what works? One of the fundamentals is, well, actually what works with learning full stop? Because if you understand what works with learning full stop, it becomes easy to say, okay, well, within that, is there a subset that works particularly well with um, online learning or not? And actually what works with learning is what works with the brain. And so we did a lot of research for the last session where we went through lots and lots of different academic papers and um, we avoided the pseudoscience elements of sort of right brain left brain stuff we went through lots of academic papers in order to to pull pull out to tease out what the key things were and we ended up with this list here and if and you've got this on the resource that you have as well so if, we, if you just click on each of those it kind of gives you a little bit more information about them and where relevant it gives you um, a link as well as you can see there but most importantly, if you look, if you look, just get Ron to stop at the moment on that one. At the bottom of each of those elements, we're asking a question that directly takes that element of brain-based learning and says, okay, within the context of online learning, how would this element be built into your practice, built into your activities or into your resources? So we do commend that resource to you to have a look at it. And there's lots of other links there on the um, Deserti resource. And it's well worth having a look at it uh, in your own time and then having a think about how that actually works. Lillian did a really nice infographic based on that. And if you've had a problem getting the tiny URL to work, here is the full URL I've just popped in the text chat pane. And that should work for you. So. That's the elements of brain-based learning. If we go to the, we now have a, an activity we did on the original session where we then say, okay, let's take each of those different elements here. And, um, and Ron's just about to pop the link if you wanted a separate link there. So you can either do this through the embedded version or you can do it through the link Ron's put in the text chat there. We then say to you, and we're saying this to you now, spend a couple of minutes, scroll down through that list. At the moment, the list is in um, popularity order based on what people, uh, when we last did this, what people were responding to. And you can um, vote on the ones that are most important to you or the ones that you know that you use most regularly in your reading. You can scroll down the list and see what's there. And you can also add arguments where the little plus signs is you can add a little argument and say, you know, either something positive or indeed a negative. You could say, yeah, you've got to be careful about this because sometimes this backfires in such and such a way. So we're going to give you a few minutes where we will be mercifully quiet for a moment and uh, you can add 
into there. If you get any problems, pop it in the text chat and we'll see if we can support. As we do have quite a lot of new people, Alastair, um, just a reminder that you can't do that on the screen that I'm sharing. You need yes. to follow the link in the text chat, either direct to the Tricitor activity or to the learning object where you've got your own copy and it's embedded in that. And again, do remember that any of these resources you can use with your own staff. Uh, indeed, uh, because they're on Xerti, you can, uh, if you've got a Xerti installation in your own um, organization, you can adapt them, take them apart, put them back together in different ways. So use the Tricida link that Ron's put in there, or if you want the, the actual page where it's embedded in the learning object, there's the long link to it that I've just popped in. So If anybody is struggling with that activity because of connectivity issue or something, getting into Tricida, then you know, do pop your own comments, etc., in the chat pane. That's absolutely fine. We can talk through that instead. And after we've given you a few minutes to do that, we're then going to go over to our speakers. And we would encourage you not just to vote, but also to add your thoughts, to add the arguments. This is a brilliant opportunity to be reflective about your practices, to look at what other people are saying and other people's context and to learn from those. So Lillian and Ron, it looks like we've still got the same um, the same top uh, strategies, active, relevant, still at the top. I wonder if there's any change lower down. Some of it is is related to how things are ordered. When something's ordered, the top things tend to get more votes in the first place. Yes. Unfortunately, yes. they're the ones you see first, aren't they? Yeah. 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 I notice the sensory is down the bottom at the moment. That's an interesting one that, that they had a sensory learning, multiple senses to provide hooks. Because I, I know from my own teaching, uh, you know, teaching in a, an environmental science, geography type context, some of our most powerful learning was actually out in the field. Mm -hmm. And equally, if you're lab based, that will be where the powerful learning takes place. Um, on that screen, you know, where it says choices, I think our next speaker, Jenny Dertmer, um, absolutely um, epitomizes that that idea of choice actually in what she's about to present so um, yeah I, this is going to lead very nicely into what Jenny's about to say so should we move over to Jenny or do you think people need a few more minutes it's a, a live resource, isn't it? So people can come back to yep. that and still contribute. Yeah. Um, They've got 1,989 days left to contribute to this. So, And if we, if we do end up with more time um, to spare at the end, we could revisit this and perhaps um, vote again based on 
from what we've heard in the three guest speaker presentations. Ah, now Carmela's just been saying that she uh, can't vote and can't register either. Um, can I just make sure, Carmela, that you've been using the, try using the link that Ron's popped in the chat pane a couple above, uh, just to make sure that you're not trying to do it on Ron's screen because um, we often make the mistake. We do this as well, and we do this regularly working together. But because you see a screen in front of you, th you think that's your active screen, but actually that's the screenshot, as it were, of Ron's screen. So, so you don't need to register where you um, put your name. Yeah, using the URL. Um, <coughs> it, it prompts you to sign in, but you can say, no, thanks, I don't want to, and then it will accept your vote. And if after that it still doesn't work, Carmela, then I think we can, you know, we'll perhaps have a chat right at the end if you want to. Um, it may be that there's some particular setup that blocks it for you or something. <clears throat> okay, so we're not going to go through the subsequent pages, are we? We're going to go no, straight. It's, it's worth people knowing that they're there and that there's activities that they could do with their own stuff. But yeah, we can, we'll go straight into... And it's, it's worth pointing out that there's this table of contents, so you don't have to go through in a linear order. And where we actually started today was the, the new journey. Um, so you can navigate direct to that section and then the following pages. So Lillian, you were going to introduce Jenny, weren't you? Well, I think Jenny can introduce herself. Um, I think she's uh, ready to screen share Jenny. Okay, I've stopped my screen sharing. Thank you. Yes, I'll just start sharing my screen. One second. Sorry, you've probably got loads of screens popped up from when <laughs> we were <laughs> asking you to click on all these. Is that clear? Is it up now? It is. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So thanks for having me today. Um, as Lillian said, my name's Jenny Detmer. Um, I'm from the University of Bedfordshire. And basically, I wanted to share with you today um, about a scheme that I've been piloting uh, with second year art and design students. So I work within learning development. So in other words, in within skill support, but I have an interest in learning technology, um, especially technology enhanced learning. So to give you a bit of context about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so it, as I've already said, it involved second year art and design students. And last year we started supporting these students and it was decided to support the students through the delivery of targeted teaching sessions during the seminar time of their theory based unit. And this is where academic skills would be embedded. And this is the model that we try to um, employ throughout our teaching because we work in a widening participation university. And we know that research identifies that a targeted approach benefits students um, who come from a non-traditional academic background. So in the first year of support with these students, um, it was quite a large group. So um, the academic for the group divided them into smaller groups and told them when and where to attend the two face-to-face -face sessions in the library that I was going to um, deliver for them. And as a consequence of that, we saw that in week one, we had 31% attendance. And in week two, we had 27% attendance. So you can see that attendance wasn't particularly high um, for this group. And it was mostly because the directive for support for this group came because there was a high percentage of students on the course with specific learning difficulties. And historically, they've had low engagement um, with our study skill services, such as drop-in. Now, during this summer, um, I led the organization of a joint All Dean and Sigma Network Symposium. And we were talking about differentiation um, within that symposium. And one of the presenters was talking about how she was giving the students a choice of session delivery. And this got me thinking, and I was thinking, oh, this sounds quite interesting. And I, I wondered how I could implement this idea into my own teaching 
within this particular cohort of students. And I did a little bit of investigation and I can also see how the HEA, they advocate the use of flexible learning where students are given choices about how, what, when and when they learn. So in other words, the pace, the place and the mode of delivery. Um, and that comes from their framework of flexible learning. And I also know that student voice is part of um, good teaching practice. Um, and I wanted to get the students input on this. So I wanted to know how they wanted to have their study skill sessions delivered. So instead of just telling them, this is where you're coming, this is how it's going to be delivered. I wanted to get their voice on this. And we know that involving students in influencing their learning uh, leads to outcomes such as increased motivation. Um, but I wanted to know if it would have an effect on their attendance. Um, so specifically, I wanted to know if allowing art and design students to choose their type of session, so lecture or workshop, and method of learning development delivery, so face-to-face, -face, live webinar, and online learning, would that increase attendance to my study skills sessions? So what I did was I went into an earlier seminar and explained to the students the difference between um, a lecture and a, um, a workshop. And I gave them details on each method of delivery. So I basically outlined what a, a webinar, a live webinar would entail. And I then asked them via a questionnaire to rate the options. So how would they prefer to have their study skill sessions delivered? Um, the top three choices were all workshops. And in order of preference, they were face-to-face, -face, webinar, and online sessions. So it was quite reassuring to me um, that workshops and face-to-face -face delivery were chosen um, as this is how we deliver most of our targeted teaching. So that kind of reinforced that we were doing what students wanted as well. Um, so I then created sign-up sheets for each of the sessions and I added on the details of the session, so how they could attend. And I also made it clear that to gain an equivalent attendance for the online session, they had to listen to all the recordings they had before a certain date and they had to correctly answer all of the quiz questions which I was going to embed within the sessions. And I decided to use um, Panopto for the online sessions because I can access the statistics for that and it will show me exactly who is listening, how much of the session they've listened to and I can see how they've answered the quiz questions if they've answered them correctly or not. So I then had to go about designing the online sessions and this is something I haven't done before. I've taught obviously face-to-face -face sessions, I've taught webinar sessions, but I hadn't used a fully online session. Um, so Lillian kindly guided me towards the ARCS model and this got me thinking about what are the different um, headings here and how can I be including them. Now since this was published we also have to um, include inclusion so we have to make sure that the content is accessible to everyone so we need to think about font sizes, color contrasts, um, so you need to build these in to motivate learners to engage with the material. So regarding attention um, what I decided to do was to um, when I've pre-recorded a session I divided it into smaller recordings, um, one for each learning objective. Um, so that broke it down and it meant that, you know, they could attend to one, one recording, have a listen to that, look at the quiz questions, then maybe go away and come back and then listen to the next recording. Um, and I also encourage active participation through the use of the discussion pane on Panopto. For relevance, um, it was all related to their upcoming assessment submission. So I used examples of past submission um, and I introduced um, feedback from the tutor in order to increase their assessment literacy. For confidence, um, I used formative feedback um, through the use of quizzes. And originally I was thinking about just putting a quiz at the end, but actually I would put one in after the teaching point or I would use it to replace um, 
a particular activity which the face-to-face -face students got feedback from me with and I would put that in a quiz form so it's a slightly different format and they would get the feedback from that um, especially if I was teaching a threshold concept and related to satisfaction um, I was using the real extracts from students work so it's contextualized for their forthcoming summative essay um, I spoke to Linian about um, how I could reduce my workload for this and she encouraged me to use the recording for the face-to-face -face session for the online session. So for the first week I pre-recorded, I did a bespoke recording for the group and in the second week I used the recording from the face-to-face -face session with the students and then I asked them what they preferred um, and they actually preferred the bespoke recording and one student um, commented that it was easier for her to make notes uh, within the recording if she had the bespoke one. Um, so really I was trying to look at the attendance figures here. So looking back at last year's, um, so the, the average attendance was about 29%. Um, so for this year, giving students the choice um, of different sessions that they could sign up for and attend. Um, I had for week one, 47% signed up and 47% attended one of the three sessions. So it was up in that first week, um, which was really great news. Um, we had some students that sign up that didn't attend and of course some attended that hadn't signed up. So it, it wasn't the same students that signed up that attended, unfortunately. And in this case, the, um, the online attendance was actually the highest. Um, so whereas when I'd asked the students and they'd said, first of all, their preference was face-to-face, -face, then it was webinar, then it was online. When it actually came to it, the online was actually more popular um, than the other types of delivery. And for the second week, um, I had 60% of students sign up, which was fantastic. Um, and again, I had 47% um, percent attend one of the three sessions. Um, and for this, the online attendance actually made up um, nearly three quarters of all attendees. So that was really up in the second week. Um, so it's been, been a successful pilot for me. So what I'm actually thinking about doing now, um, unfortunately, the webinar attendance wasn't so great. Um, so I'm thinking that going forward, I would just have a choice of two for the students, um, but I've got some level four. So first year art and design students who've got a theory based unit coming up next semester. So I'm thinking about piloting the same with them, seeing how it gets on. And actually, if they get on with it in the first year, when it comes to the second year and they repeat this pilot I've just done with this cohort of students, they'll be more used to this format that I am setting them. So yeah, so I'm really pleased with the um, attendance from the students um, and I'm hoping to also transfer this to other courses. So I'm thinking about where attendance isn't so great and how I can give the students a further choice to engage with the learning material. So it's been a real learning opportunity for me um, and I'm hoping, yes, that I can transfer this to, to other courses and other students going forward. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, I was really, really struck by the fact that um, we, we were experimenting, weren't we, whether you could reduce the workload by using your webinar recording um, for the online. And what you you found out is that actually um, that doesn't pay any dividends that actually you put in the extra little bit of work targeting the online learner and that has a different psych psychological effect uh, learning effect on the students and maybe they prefer it they, they can sense that you're targeting them um, so I thought that was quite interesting um, yes it was um it was good to get that feedback from them because you can you can guess can't you and you can make yeah. assumptions but actually hearing it from them yeah mm -hmm. that's been really useful yeah, absolutely. So that was really, really good. And and also this this um, a couple of other questions there about um, yeah face to face. I mean, I I kind of thought that maybe the online attracted them because they could go at their own pace, whereas a webinar is still going at the pace of a teacher. 
Absolutely, yes. And, you know, and with a live webinar, they're still having to join at a certain time. So it's almost like being there for the face to face, but without having as much interactivity with the tutor and with their peers. So yes, absolutely. I can see why the online would be would be more popular. So it was it was good to see that that extra time I'd put into the recording was worth and I was getting the attendance back from that. Mm. And uh, Steve just mentioned this idea of maybe allowing students to um, kind of join a live stream, uh, really, to so they get that interaction, uh, kind of like this, they get the, the interaction while they're actually um, attending. But uh, mm. again, that relies on you making sure that you, you, you put in the kind of questions that distance learners can also engage with absolutely yes it's um it, it, it's definitely a process of of trying something and then maybe next time trying something different and and seeing how that works with the students mm. okay so lots of interesting discussion on the chat which will leave you to to browse through and answer in your own time there's a there's a question there from jonathan that might be worth just picking up on because it's a specific question oh yeah. yeah whether there was a difference in learning outcomes between the different modes uh jenny no basically the learning material that the students were covering was the same okay do you have any sense as to the uh effectiveness with which they were able to apply the learning or is that a different research project entirely yeah i think so so um i guess that might be looking at the the grades um, of the students that attended the, the different types of sessions possibly um, and I'm also getting some feedback because we just finished the last session so getting some feedback from the students on how how effective they felt their learning is going to be and how they're going to be able to apply their learning within their their assessment that's coming up okay that would be interesting yeah yeah I think we want to invite you back uh, further down <laughs> yes, the line to yes. report on that well thanks for having me today thank you very much Catherine um, are you ready to share your screen and mm -hmm. that's come through okay all right shall i go ahead absolutely okay thank you um so I'm Catherine Stapleford. I'm lecturer in digital education from the University of Leeds and I wanted to share with you today an activity based on the jigsaw learning technique that I, I did with my, my students. Um, before I talk about that activity, I'll just give you some uh, background information, which is quite important considering the nature of the activity and the teaching context. Um, so it's a 100% online distance learning program um, and the students attend for, from all over the world. It's quite an international cohort and the program is designed according to a flipped learning model. So each weekly unit is centered around a synchronous webinar and the learners have content on the virtual learning environment to work through asynchronously in preparation for the webinar, which consists of small group discussions that are based on the content. And then that's followed up with an asynchronous discussion board activity that's based on an academic paper. So this particular unit was uh, week seven. And um, so by now the students are quite familiar with the, the format and the, the learning environment. And with the topic being conversational and dialogic learning and with reference to social media as the digital element. So I felt that this topic lent itself to a more active learning strategy. And I wanted the students to learn about that theory um, by experiencing it rather than by passively doing a reading or, or viewing a recorded lecture. And also by now, by week seven, I've, I wanted to shake things up a bit. Um, the, the flip learning model works well, but it, I felt it was becoming a bit samey, a bit formulaic. And I just wanted to try something different. Um, other reasons for, for trying this activity um, are based on the, the, the nature of the students. So they have varying levels of prior knowledge of teaching and learning theories. Some of them are trained and experienced teachers and others have no sort of pedagogic background or training at all. So I felt that this kind of task would allow students to work at their own pace and from their own starting point. 
And also with it being quite an international cohort, the students are split between those who are used to taking an active role in their learning and who are familiar with the social um, learning approach and others who are less familiar, less confident with that and those who take a more passive role. And I wanted to ensure that all students had something meaningful to contribute and had a reason to contribute. So those are the sort of reasons that I, I thought that the, um, an adaptation of the jigsaw technique would be an appropriate tool because the underlying principle of this technique is that it's an information gap activity. So all students have a bit of information, um, but they, they don't see the whole picture until they work together and combine their individual pieces. So it's very much um, based on an active and dialogic theory of learning. Now I said I used an adaptation of the jigsaw technique. So normally this would happen within the course of one teaching session, so uh, a lesson, whereas um, for, for me, it spanned three teaching activities over the course of the unit, just because of the, the distance learning context, really. The students are already divided into three groups. There's about eight or nine students in each group. And I had four theories I wanted students to learn about. So I allocated two or maybe three students to each theory. The students then uh, researched their allocated theory and they could do that individually or working collaborative, collaboratively with their partner. And then they contributed their findings to a group wiki that I'd set up in advance. So by now they're experts on their allocated theory. And so when they come to the synchronous webinar, they're divided up into smaller breakout groups. So each group had at least one expert on each of the theories and then they share their expertise. Um, and then we come back together and we discuss the relevance of uh, the theories to, to their own practice. And then that's followed up with some feedback on the wikis, um, some tutor produced content to fill in any gaps and the asynchronous discussion board task that was based on an academic paper. Now the Tricida tool I didn't use. I um, was reminded of this when reviewing the first Future Teacher webinar and online uh, learning and also the preparation for this one. And I think it would be a really nice activity um, where students could select their preferred model and then justify their choice. So I think I'll definitely incorporate that next time. Uh, the next three slides are just screenshots of what the students were presented with within the virtual learning environment. So first they were given a, a bit of background rationale as to why it was different this time and some brief instructions. Um, and then this is one of the, the wikis that I'd set up with further more detailed instructions and the allocations for the students to the theories and also the pages with um, where they were to populate with their findings. And this is one of the, the completed wiki pages that the two of the students um, populated and they did decide to do that collaboratively. They, they divided it up and hence the different colours. So going back to the first um, webinar on online learning, the, the first future teacher talk on online learning, where Lillian, Lillian talked about the importance of models and frameworks, and future teacher often uses these two frameworks, um, the brain-based learning elements and the ARCS model of instructional design. And I think um, the jigsaw technique addresses both of these quite well. It certainly meets all of the ARCS criteria. I won't go through them all. I can perhaps address that later if there are any questions, but it's, I think it's quite clear that how it addresses those. And then for the elements of brain-based learning, again, it addresses most of those. The ones that I had questions about were the choice because I did assign the theories to the learners. They didn't have a choice in that. I could have given them a choice, but I felt because of this task was already fairly complex, plus the distance learning context, I just wanted them to be very clear and, and sure about what they had to do when they arrived at this unit. I didn't want any room for error. Um, but that could be something that I might consider for future. The emotional element, I'm not 
apart from relevance to their own context, I'd be interested to know how am I incorporate more of that um, element. And then the rehearsed, well, there wasn't much input from me formatively going through this, but there were opportunities for self and, and, and peer assessment as they were doing the research phase. Um, okay, so just some caveats then for using this kind of activity. Firstly, I think the nature of my students, they were, I could assume they were digitally interested and competent because they were enrolled on a um, master's in digital education. It might not be um, as easy with um, non-digital um, students. Secondly, the grouping was quite challenging because we offer the webinars at um, two different times to cater for students in different time zones and with professional commitments. So I'm never quite sure who's going to turn up at which webinar. Um, so it was just a case of waiting and hoping that there'd be enough of the so-called experts for each theory. And I, I, I was reasonably confident because over the three groups, that's two or three for each theory, there were about between six to eight, you know, for, for each theory. So um, I was fairly sure it was going to work out evenly. And then finally, the quality of the contributions did actually vary quite a bit. So um, I think there is some need for tutor produced content as a follow up uh, generally to fill in any gaps, but also to cater for those students who do still feel that they want that tutor input. So that's the flipped distance learning jigsaw technique. There's um, a couple of links there, um, but. I don't think you'll be able to click on those. So I'll put those in the chat in a second. The first is um, quite a simple, straightforward um, article on the British Council. The second is a more academic um, HE, online learning context for using the technique. And the third is a really nice um, YouTube video that Ron actually found that, that goes through the, the setting up and the sequence of setting up that um, technique. So that's the, that's the jigsaw task um, from a distance learning perspective. Thank you. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, I, I was just thinking, you know, where it doesn't quite fit all the brain-based learning uh, uh, features. Uh, it, it, it almost doesn't matter so long as mm. it prompts your thinking. Yeah. And so um, I, I guess that when you reflected on your model relative to those, did it give you any insights into your uh, learning design? Yeah, as I said, I think that the, the choices element um, by allowing a bit more advanced planning, um, I could build that in. Mm. I, I just wondered if you needed to, because uh, yeah. as you think, you were already um, changing uh, the technique, to, so you were already introducing something novel. Mm. Any, mm. So sometimes, you know, some of the elements um, it's not necessary that you put every single element in sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and, it, and it met my needs and, and my yeah. context um, and what I was trying to achieve, I, I feel, for that. So, yeah, the, the, the others that were less um, evident were, were not really high on my agenda for, for, for this particular activity. Yeah. So there's a question from Marcus. I wonder what your thought is about that, Catherine. Um, Kath, um, Marcus is saying, could you provide previous year's wikis for each cohort to enhance and improve rather than starting again? What's your thought on that? Yes, I think that I might try that actually in a, in a, for another activity. For the purposes of this, the wiki was in a way to, to give them that confidence and advanced preparation and something to refer back to and to see what each other were doing as well. Yeah. So to have some um, knowledge and familiarity before they arrived at the webinar. Um, I suppose as a follow up, a more polished piece, it, it could be, um, yeah, blended and with previous years ones. I might. Yeah, it'd certainly be nice to at least share those with, with future cohorts because of the work that's gone into them. Yeah. A couple of things that you and I discussed, Catherine. One was that you, you'd you use the jigsaw method quite a bit in face-to-face -face sessions. And I wonder what your thoughts are on whether 
you know people could just go straight to using that method online and and also <laughs> we talked about the fact that wikis are not for everybody but really it doesn't matter what system what VLE or what wiki mm. but they you know you it's just a collaborative tool that is required isn't yeah it? yeah exactly um we, we could have used a, a shared Google or Microsoft document to um, to do that. It's just that this is all, it's there and ready within the VLE. Um, so I, I thought I would use it because students are from all over the world and there's <coughs> access issues with certain platforms. Um, I felt keeping it simple and all within the virtual learning environment would be more accessible. Um, and yeah, with, with the the face to face based version of, of this kind of task, it's it's traditionally used in language teaching, and that's when I first um, used it. And and you actually provide the information to the students um, to, to learn the bit. Whereas I adapted it because I wanted students to actively find out for themselves. I didn't give them anything; they had to go away and research. Mm. Um, and it was that it was more longitudinal than in a in a face to face context. But I think you would need to be quite confident with your use of the, the technique plus the, um, the technology. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to move us on. It's fascinating. I'm really grateful for that. But I've just noticed in, my, in the lesson plan, we've got um, there's a, an eight minutes slot that I thought was there that somehow or other isn't there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to um, move us on to our third speaker, Chris Thompson from JISC. And so, Chris, if you want to share your screen now okay. be, thank you thank you very much that was excellent Catherine um, and keep questions coming into the text chat as well can you hear me can you see my dragon I can hear you and I can see your dragon I know what you're thinking the dragon is beautiful isn't she uh, <laughs> the dragon doesn't have a name by the way everybody I use dragons quite a lot when I'm talking about storytelling uh, please please name my dragon in the chat that would be really helpful um, just to uh, set uh, so I'm going to go a real rate of knots for this one. Um, just to set this in a little bit of context, if you don't know uh, what JISC is, I come from a very different background from uh, what Jenny and Catherine, uh, <coughs> how they do. Um, uh, I work for JISC. JISC is an organization that goes around uh, education institutions, organizations in the UK offering support and advice around the use of technology to support uh, teaching and learning amongst other things. So I'm coming at this from more kind of from the staff development project support point of view rather than from, you know, I haven't actually, I'm not the sort of person that actually gets in and, and runs classes or runs courses with, um, with students. Just so that kind of sets it into a little bit of context for you. So yeah, Alistair asked me to come in and talk a little bit about um, digital storytelling. I realized, Alistair, with a bit of shock this morning over breakfast, that I've been doing digital storytelling since about 2005, which is 15 years of doing this thing. And that was profoundly shocking to me because that now makes me feel very, very old. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, ancient, ancient. Um, but yeah, this is something which I've done in a lot of different contexts. Uh, I started off doing digital storytelling uh, as an approach with actually with, with um, school children uh, in Sheffield, but it's something which is something which is of such universal application and appeal that you're, it's, you're able to do it with preschool children, you're able to do it with seniors, you're able to do it with researchers, um, undergraduates, um, senior leaders within organizations all that sort of thing it's something which is really really flexible and uh, for that reason it's, it's worth exploring as something uh to to add to the um the armory of skills for for a future teacher um i, I just kind of wanted to start off with a, little, a bit of scene setting though and just to um to get some thoughts about kind of storytelling, forget about the digital side of things for a moment, why is storytelling so important to us? So whenever I'm running a workshop around this, I usually start with this question about why, why do we bother telling stories to each other? Because you could argue we've been doing storytelling as long as we have had culture. So stories must be doing something for us. So it'll be interesting just to have a look at the chat just to see what uh, people might you know, think as you know, what are the purposes of storytelling? Why do we, why do we do it? Let's see if I can reclaim the, uh, the chat window from someone. When you're working on multiple screens, this doesn't work very well. 
I, don't worry, Chris. Okay, if you carry on the presentation, I'll just tell you people of uh, things that are coming in. Our, our stories hit lots of brain based elements, entertainment, passing mm. on information, sharing experiences. I love scaring our kids, sense, <laughs> sense making, oh, human to human connection, connecting to others. So, yeah, yeah. okay, excellent. Yeah. We, could, we, could, we could go on for an entire day talking about this. In fact, you could probably do an entire uh, PhD around why we tell stories. But for our purposes, there are. I guess there are three key elements when it comes to teaching and learning. Somebody mentioned it very specifically. It's about sense making. So stories are the tool that we use as human beings to make sense out of experiences. Um, life isn't nice and neat and tidy. There's no beginning, middle and end to things, generally speaking. Um, but what we do is we, we put a structure on those experiences and that's what becomes a story. So I was going to work this morning and this thing happened to me. And this was the result at the end of it. It's, it's a way of giving us a framework to talk about things that have happened. Now, whether that's things that have happened to us, things that have happened to other people, or, or events in, in different sorts of contexts. So I, I know um, University of Warwick um, did a storytelling activity around historical artifacts. So talking about um, how uh, an artifact in their collection actually kind of fitted into the historical record. So they told stories around it. So it's, it's there as a sense making tool for us. Um, stories, we also use stories for influence, communication, persuasion. Uh, and as such, they're a very powerful tool for people to develop as part of their communication skills. Uh, whether that's, you know, they're going on to become teachers or maybe they're going on well, any, any form of work, there will be some requirement for influence and persuasion and communication, affective communication. So using storytelling uh, and getting people to do storytelling can be really helpful with that. And also memory, it becomes easier to remember stuff if you can wrap a story around it, uh, rather than just thinking about abstract facts. So there's all sorts of things at play here uh, as to why storytelling is an important thing for us to do. Uh, which sort of moves us on to kind of what, what do we mean by digital storytelling? What's, what's going on here? Uh, digital storytelling itself, well, it, it can be pretty much anything you like. Uh, digital storytelling is just, I have a story and I want to tell it using digital means. So uh, we see these people in the picture here are using iMovie, they're using um, IMAX to, to create a video, but it doesn't have to be a video. It could be something as simple as a blog post. It could be an Instagram post or a series of Instagram posts and something. It could be a podcast. That doesn't ma matter. The digital side of things is just the vehicle for getting it across. What we're really interested in is how we can use stories um, to support that learning process. Um, if you want an example of what a particular sort of digital storytelling might look like, um, I'll, you can catch this example in the resources that Alistair's sharing. I'm not going to share it now because we just don't have time. This was actually one of my first ever digital stories that I ever made. Uh, which is reflecting on a personal experience. Um, so if you want to get an idea about what one form of storytelling could look like, which is based around still images and a narrated voiceover, it's very simple to achieve. Um, but hopefully uh, this example shows you, 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 you can get a nice bit of emotional punch uh, as well as uh, something interesting that people are going to remember out of it. So it's not an educational example, but uh, it might be it might be relevant to you. Um, now, the thing that I really want to stress about digital storytelling is that it's as much about process as it is about product. It's very easy to focus on the fact that you're making something with digital storytelling. So you're creating a video out of a story uh, or a blog post. So there's a thing you can see and you can share. So it's, it's very easy to get fixated on that. Uh, it's, it's an important part of digital storytelling, but actually the process of how you arrive at that digital story is just as important. So take, for, uh, you know, a typical digital storytelling project, let's say we were taking, um, we have some learners and we're, we're asking them to reflect on a formative learning experience. Maybe it was a placement somewhere, maybe it was an apprenticeship uh, within another organization. Um, and we want them to find a story that they can tell about their experiences that kind of summed it up or tells us something about what it is that they learned. Um, so what we would do in that sense is encourage people, right before you get anywhere near the computers, it's kind of sit down and just talk, share the experiences, listen to what other people are saying, and then, oh, good grief, there's the time. Um, so 
it's from that that then people write down their ideas, share their ideas, refine them before they get anywhere near a computer where they're choosing images or, or recording voiceover. And that's actually where the majority of the learning happens. Um, so just to kind of round things off, I was asked to kind of reflect a bit on kind of how this um, impacted on brain-based learning, how it kind of fits in. And pretty much you could make an argument for all the things that Alistair was talking about before about what makes up brain-based learning is there a storytelling is an important part of that and you can see some of the ones that i've picked out here yes storytelling can be emotional you talked about entertainment it's about social it's about managing uh groups to maximize their social bonds um and explicitly connecting people to experiences the needs or ambitions so we tell stories to help us to do all of these things now there are a couple of tools that i've linked to in um the resources that you've been sharing with, which i find really really useful and are also free dead easy to use um, which are things like adobe spark uh, or microsoft sway uh, which are certainly really helpful um, and, and great starting points for thinking about what this might look like um, if you want to know more, I'm going to put a link in the um, the chat, actually, which is the blog post about um, some examples of where people have been putting digital learning to, to use. And primarily it's around Yorkshire University's approach to getting in touch with harder to reach students, but it's also um, looks at Ulster University's work through Richard Beggs. I notice also that Mary Jacobs is on the session this morning. Mary um, in Aberystwyth, uh, they do uh, or have done in the past lots of stuff around digital storytelling so she's very she's worth talking to but these sides of things so we run a training workshop which is happening there's a link there but there's also a conference on this which is happening in Loughborough next year which we'd love to see people at that's, I'm going to stop that's great Chris I'm really sorry to um no 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 because as, as you say you can do loads on this what I particularly love about the the bit that Chris has brought at the end of this uh, at the end of the three presenters was that that's the bit where the emotional um, really comes to the fore in a way that um, is sometimes harder to achieve in some of the other learning. So thank you very much, Chris. I'm going to pass over to Ron now for the, uh, the final bits um, and for your final reflection as well. Thanks, Alistair. Um, very quickly, Chris mentioned a number of tools in this slide. Of course, what we're using, Zerti, is also a great tool for um, use with digital storytelling. The page that I'm sharing here now is is one that we created for the original delivery of online not online learning what works but we've updated the text a little bit and there's a recording there at the bottom that's um, Alastair, myself and Lillian discussing um, uh, our use of Zerti at that time. Um, next steps, um, our guest speakers today all volunteered to um, share their experience and we'd be particularly keen to hear from you if you'd like to hear uh, share your experience on flip to learning which is the topic of our next session um, but that won't be till January and we don't we haven't decided on the exact date for that yet but it will be in January um, tips there about joining our mailing list where we'll notify about the recording and so on um, here's a, a an 11 step instruction on how to access our uh, project virtual learning environment called Pedit and how to register and access all the journeys on there. Leave you to um, visit that in your own time. Um, some info about us and if you wanted more help with implementing and, and putting into practice future teacher resources and so on, um, we'd be interested to hear from you and uh, there's some info there that you can visit. But the final thing we always ask people to do is uh, to share what one thing will you do as a result of what you've seen and heard today. Um, we have a text wall here that's embedded in the resource. We'll put the, the link direct to the page in the text chat. Um, you could comment in the text chat, but if you, if you share your thoughts of what one thing in the, in the resource itself in the text wall, then that will appear as part of the resource and people will be able to see that and you'll be able to see that when you revisit the resource to recap on what we've covered today. So please have a think about what you want to share. People will often say, um, uh, revisit the resource and share the resource, but we're thinking more particular actions that you might take as a result of, so perhaps it might be to, to actually have a look and put into practice the jigsaw uh, method or digital storytelling or um, whatever it is that's, uh, or to revisit the frameworks and the brain-based learning and so on. And just remember, if you are trying to type in the text wall, don't type on the text wall on Ron's screen. 
uh, but on your own version of the Xerti object. And I've just put the link into that. Ron's put the link in there as well. Um, just a couple of a couple of entries up on the chat pane. Alison, we'd love to see you at more webinars. And for those of you for whom this is the first of the future teacher webinars, we have got 19 wonderful future webinars already in the bag uh, where we've created the resources, we've got the recordings, and we're going through every one of those again in this kind of way, giving new case studies and people an opportunity to chat, to, um, to share experiences, which is incredibly valuable. Um, I think we're going to name the dragon Archibald Theodore Flamethrower. <laughs> there were some very Thank good names, that. weren't there? <laughs> Gizzy Dunlop, I think. Sorry for the, sorry for the spamming. Uh, I think um, it didn't update quickly enough on my Wi-Fi, so I kept pressing submit. <laughs> and I think someone else has done the same. <laughs> Absolutely. If, you, if you're sharing your resources across the uni, do drop us a line to let us know. Uh, or if you've embedded it on a page, do drop us a line to let us know how you've done that. You know, um, certainly at, at, at the University of York, I've, I've kind of added it to um, a page where it's quite visible for um, uh, tutors to kind of see it as part of the ecosystem of training. And I think as well, just to encourage people to ask their lecturers in their universities to uh, share their practice is a really good form of staff development to come on a webinar and share your practice because we can all um, help uh, develop each other's thinking. Um, uh, and, and, and that's how you kind of uh, get the staff development by actually participating and presenting. Brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Mary Jacob. Oh, it's lovely to see that uh, Trello that Mary Jacob's uh, pulled together. It's a very good uh, kind of uh, visual board, Trello board of, of all the links and absolutely brilliant. I like that very much. Okay. So, are we still recording, Ron? Uh, we are, but I'm I'm aware that we normally stop the recording at this point, and then as people leave, there's a bit more of an informal chat. So, I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>